Welcome to Qualified Opinions, where we test the ideas and limits, the knowns and known unknowns around freedom and order in contemporary politics and society. We invite you to listen as we engage with leading and emerging thinkers across disciplines and issues who will sharpen our thinking on the topics shaping our discourse. Welcome back. Of the cherished liberties of a free society, economic, political, and civil, economic freedom holds a special place. It's not only an end in and of itself, but economic freedom sustains the other freedoms. When personal choice, voluntary exchange, and the protection of private property are not secured, political freedom and civil liberties can't meaningfully be exercised. This is why I'm so excited to be talking with my dear friend, Matt Mitchell, about economic freedom and also about the new index just published by the Fraser Institute called Economic Freedom of the World 2024 Annual Report. Matt, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's always great to chat with you, Vera. So first, before we start, I always ask my guests, how did you, how did you get here? How did you get to study economic freedom? What's your, what's your career path? What did it look like? Well, I know you always ask that. And I was thinking, I don't know if many of your guests say uh, because of you, uh, but <laughs> you know, you had a lot of a big influence on me, Vero. I was in graduate school and I had a job at uh, a grant making organization. And, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of interesting to, have your, an influence on a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, I didn't, I just wasn't excited because I I wanted to be on the other side of the table, actually doing the activity. And so I would look at the, at these organizations like Mercatus that we would give money to. And I, I wanted to have your job and I'd met you a couple of times and I really, uh, you know, enjoyed what, uh, I always, always learned from you every time I I chatted with you. And so, um, I think I, I went out to lunch with you and I said, I want to be on that side. How do I do that? And you suggested I, I um, call up Brian Hooks and I said, hey, I, I, basically the same thing. I, I, I'd like to be on that side of the table. Uh, so they, Mercatus took a, a chance on me. Uh, I took a chance on Mercatus, I should say, too. Uh, my, I, I went home and talked to my wife and I said, so they've made me an offer. And uh, I know you're only, I know you're eight months pregnant and it's a pay cut. And also they, they're only guaranteeing a job for six months. <laughs> and, um, I forgot about that. Yeah. My wife didn't uh, hesitate. She's like, you should do it. I can see the excitement you have uh, in your eyes. And so I, I did. I, I uh, moved over to Mercatus and I was there for about uh, a dozen years, worked with you. Yeah. Some of my favorite years at Mercatus. <laughs> I remember when you arrived and we were in that little office at GMU, the round building. And yeah. it was so awesome. Yeah. And one of the things just sort of all along, both at Mercatus and, and, and previously in graduate school, when I'm teaching, whenever I'm talking to people, I've always found, I've always gone back to the, the Index of Economic Freedom as one of the, the best pedagogical tools. If you want to introduce somebody to the value of freedom, especially economic freedom, uh, I've always found it a just really, really powerful way to do it. And so we'll get into the details of what the index is and how it was started and all that. But, uh, it, you know, it, it any, anybody listening, if you want to help people understand economic freedom or the value of freedom more generally, I really do think this is the best place to start. So uh, a few years ago, I got an opportunity to, to move over to the Fraser Institute. They're based in, in Canada and they've produced the uh, Economic Freedom of the World Index for nearly 30 years. Did it start in 1996? 96 was the first, uh, was the first index. That's right. So yeah, yeah I, I, I leapt at it. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk about economic freedom. Yep. So I was kind of like, a, and in fact, I asked you before you, the recording, should we start by talking about economic freedom about or about the index? But let's talk first about economic freedom, right? It's like, so what is it you call economic freedom? Yeah. So it's a great question, especially right now, because I've noticed, you know, you've written a column on this and uh, the Harris campaign is actually embracing the term economic freedom. Um, I sort of, you know, feel like a uh, uh, Inigo Montoya, they keep using this word, but I don't think it means what it means, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the way she, let's start with the way she she uses the term, you know, she's uh, part of it, she rolled it out uh, in support of her plans to help African-American business uh, entrepreneurs, 
which uh, I would love to see African-Americans uh, start businesses. That's wonderful. But her plan to help them in part is to give them government backed loans. So that is really not economic freedom for a very simple, uh, simple reason is if you take resources from Peter to give resources to Paul, Paul may feel better and may, may feel more free because he can do more, but you've undermined the freedom of Peter, right? So at, the way we use the term economic freedom, I think is the way it really goes all the way back to John Locke and, and other you know, founding classical liberals is we use it as a negative, negative freedom. The idea of, of freedom is that you are free when you, can, you are allowed to make your own choices and nobody is stopping you. There's no external, external force that's keeping you from making your own choices. Now, uh, and, and in order to be, for me to be free, I have to respect the like liberties of others. And so I also have to respect the freedom of others. I can't inv- stop them from making their own choices. It's really just as simple as that. And then economic freedom is, I think, best conceived as a subset of all human freedoms. So if uh, human freedom is the ability, is uh, you are allowed to make your own choices about uh, how to shop, about who to marry, about uh, what you're going to do, what you're going to wear that day, and who you're going to support, then economic freedom is the subset of that. That is that is that is the the first thing I mentioned: how to sh- you know where you're going to shop, what you're going to buy, who you're going to contract with, how you're going to acquire and use uh, property, including productive property. It's those sorts of, of activities. So the, the key here is that it's focusing on it's what people are allowed to do. Now, I, I, just to elaborate, one more point is now you get to the question of what is government's role in economic freedom? And it's possible that government, in, if you start thinking about, okay, well, how does government affect my ability, my, what I'm allowed to do in terms of my, making my own economic choices? There's a, a lot of things that it, it needs to sort of get out of the way is it needs to not, it, it could stop me from making my own choices by taxing me. It could stop me from making my own choices by regulating, by through barriers to trade, things like that. There are some things that government can do that can enable me making my own choices, mainly by stopping other people from stopping me from making my own choices. So if government polices fraud, if government stops the, the application of force, if it protects me, uh, then it does allow me to to make more of my own choices. Is a place where you can actually go and and if there's a conflict over a contractual conflict. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that's that's the role. Exactly. Even though we want to acknowledge that you know justice and enforcement of contract can be done in a completely private matter. Yes. Certainly. You know, it, it may be the least offensive thing that the government does. Certainly, certainly, and and you know, a lot of our behavior, of course, is governed by all kinds of implicit uh, contracts and implicit types of governance. That you know, the the vast majority of opportunities for humans to exploit one another are thwarted not by government but by uh, other governance mechanisms like etiquette, <laughs> yeah. repeat dealings, and um, you know, private insurance and things like that. Mm-hmm. Well, so now that we understand what economic freedom is, I mean, there's a reason why we love it so much. So why do we care so much actually about our ability to to do all these things in yeah. the economic world? Uh, what's what's so great about economic freedom? Yeah. So, you know, you said in your intro, and I was glad you did it, uh, you, you said this, I would say that there's, you know, if you think about the, the two major branches of philosophy, you know, there is util- the utilitarian reasons to value economic freedom. And there's also deontological reasons to value economic freedom It's valuable in and of itself. So and that's often I do start with that because uh, I, I, I feel like I, I have to be upfront and acknowledge that I think most of us think it just intrinsically valuable that we be allowed to make economic choices. And if you want to understand, you know, what are the consequences of not allowing people to make economic choices, just from that, from the, irrespective of their benefits, just think of ju- just the value of the choice itself. Take a close look at the at the Soviet Union, or uh, you and I spoke earlier about uh, Estonia. Uh, you know, look at what what it means if you can't a- a buy your own house, or if you have to, or you can't determine who gets to live in your own house. If if the government, as they did in the Soviet Union, decides that nine meters square is is too much, and that anybody who has more than nine meters square, they have to have strangers come live in their house. Uh, 
well, a lot of us sort of at a deep down intrinsic level say, damn it, that's not right. People should be allowed to make that kind of economic choice. So that's the first answer is just, you know, based on, you know, the value of people making their own choice, it's, it's, it, I think it has some value. But then there's the instrumentalist or the utilitarian answer, which is, as it turns out, not only uh, are free people able to make their own choices, and that's valuable in itself, but they seem to be prosperous people. You go around the world, and that's really, part, we know this in large part due to the Economic Freedom of the World Index. But it turns out that, you know, the, if you compare the most free to the least free places, uh, people live longer, they have higher incomes, they have lower infant mortality rates, they have a, higher levels of trust. There's all kinds of things that humans value, and they seem to correlate very, very strongly with economic freedom. So one of the things that I care about is economic growth, and I know you do too, and, and economic freedom and economic growth is, is, is really joined to the hip, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So you, you can, how do we know that? Okay, so to, to kind of understand this, you got to go back uh, all the way uh, today, uh, 2024 is the 40th anniversary of 1984, right? And so mm -hmm. back in 1984, there was a Mont Pelerin Society meeting, and I think it was in England. And as you might expect, it's 1984. So they're debating and talking about Orwell's 1984. And they have this, uh, th this long debate about whether economic freedom how does it correlate with other types of freedom, like political freedom? And, you know, they're bringing, you know, Friedman had famously hypothesized that you can't have uh, political freedom without uh, a good measure of economic freedom. Well, so actually I can read that quote. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think it's in 1962. He said, history speaks with a single voice on the relation between political freedom and a free market. I know of no example in time or place of a society that has been marked by a large measure of political freedom and that has not also used something comparable to a free market to organize the bulk of economic activity. Exactly. Exactly. So that, that, that quote was bandied about. Friedman himself was there and people started debating it, but they kind of found themselves sort of going around in circles because they had no way of actually testing this hypothesis. So the uh, founder of the Fraser Institute is this, this uh, man named Mike Walker. And uh, Mike was uh, good friends with uh, the Freedmans. And after, they, after this debate, he sits down with them for lunch. And he has what I think he's later characterized it as a sort of a harebrained idea. He said, what if we measure it? He said, what? He said, what if we measure economic freedom? If we measure economic freedom, we might then be able to answer the question, does economic, does political freedom depend on economic freedom? And the Freedmans love the idea. And Michael say, you know, it was really key, actually Rose Friedman, uh, especially was keen on the idea. And so they helped him. And so, it, uh, they were very deliberate and they took quite a while doing this for a, the better part of a decade. They organized a series of conferences. I think Liberty Fund uh, supported them. Uh, the Freedmans uh, would would, would uh, help Mike invite all these luminaries. They had, I think, some 66 participants, including three Nobel laureates, include, which was uh, Milton, uh, Doug North participated, uh, Stiegler participated, our former colleague, the late uh, Gordon Tullock participated, you name it, you know, uh, luminaries of the, the, the uh, market intellectual world, they participated. And at the end of it, they had developed this idea of, you know, what exactly is economic freedom? It goes back to that, what we were talked about at the beginning. And then here's a kind of idea about how we measure it. And so uh, one of the uh, participants was a, a, a man named uh, James Wartney. Uh, he passed away earlier this year. Yep. He was a Florida State University professor, uh, really made enormous contributions to economics in lots of different fields as a teacher, as a, as a researcher. And uh, the Economic Freedom of the World Index was, was uh, maybe one of his best legacies. He has had this idea, you know, maybe we just try to, try to gather as much data as we can from as many countries as we can on ways that government restricts your ability to make your own economic choice. And then later they added the idea that government uh, also protects persons and their property. So it enables people to make choices by not uh, as I said, by, by keeping others from, from interfering with their choice. And so he teamed together with a guy named uh, Bob Lawson, who was his graduate student. And they, in 1996, they put out the first index. 
I didn't realize that Bob was involved from the beginning. He was, yeah, very beginning, very beginning. Bob is at SMU. That's right. right? Yes. So Bob is now the lead author of the index, um, and yet, like I said, he's been involved the, uh, for 30 years now. At this point, uh, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary in a couple of years. And as a so, what what the index does is it takes uh, 45 indicators, variables in each of uh, they're grouped into five areas: uh, size of government, property rights, and uh, protection of persons, le- legal system, and property rights, sound money freedom to trade internationally and regulations. So they, they gather 45 indicators of, of each of these variables um, across 165 countries. They now have data going all the way back to 1970. And it's an annual index that, you know, it, it tells us, okay, Singapore is more free than uh, Mexico and Mexico is more free than Venezuela. And uh, we get an idea of what the ways in which different countries are free. Hong Kong tops the list. Uh, they just edged out Singapore. Uh, one of the thing, ways that they, that uh, one of the reasons why Singapore is not number one is uh, they had quite a bit of inflation last year. So that that's, uh, so that's one dimension. It's a, it's a ding towards a sound money. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, but so it's kind of interesting. I, I, we're going to talk about, about the, the ranking itself uh, later on, but it's, it's kind of interesting that Hong Kong became uh, number one at the time was China is taking over. Yes. Uh, so uh, Hong Kong has actually been at the top of the index for the entire time they've done it. Uh, and, and, you know, Milton Friedman used to talk about this, this, this great experiment with Hong Kong, you know, the, That's right. yeah. the you know, the, mo- the, the freest place on earth, but uh, they are just barely hanging on to that slot at this point. Um, yeah. And so they've fallen in each of the last, uh, I think it's five years, mm-hmm. uh, and quite precipitously in terms of the legal system and property rights, have, 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 you've seen quite a bit of decay. Uh, and so I'm not super confident that they will manage to hang on for, for much longer. But so this brings an, a, a, an important distinction is, you know, a lot of people will say, how could that possibly be with China cracking down? Well, this is, this is ec- a measure of economic freedom. With this index, we're not looking at personal freedoms, the ability to protest the government and things like that. Yeah. We actually have another index, the Human Freedom Index, which does incorporate that stuff. And Hong Kong used to be in the top 10 and is now way down around 46 or 47 in that index. So, yeah, and, I, and in fact, I saw someone on Twitter uh, say, how is it possible that the Saudis are so, uh, are, are so well placed, ranked in your economic freedom index when they're so terrible on religion and and political liberty. And you, you said, you said this only measures economic freedom. That's right. So it's just, and that the Saudis are actually really terrible on that other index. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But so to go back to my economic, uh, so we, you, you have this index where you rate, you, you, you rank countries based on how free they are economically. Mm -hmm. And then that allows us to kind of actually see how does this connect how did the freest country do on economic growth? And so what do you find? Yes. So it, this is the dimension where I think the index has been just much more wildly successful than even Mike Walker could have anticipated is they put this index out and economists around the world got to work using it. Mm-hmm. So at this point, it's now, you know, it's got some 14,000 uh, citations but more importantly than that is it's got about a, there's been about a thousand peer reviewed academic studies that use the index to look at all kinds of things. And a majority of these studies, if you just kind of want to put it in the simplest terms, or do they find economic freedom is associated with bad stuff? Is, is it mixed or good stuff? A majority of them associate economic freedom with good stuff. And so in particular, you know, they find that economic freedom, there's a, uh, Uh, 90% of studies that looked at economic freedom and and immigration find that people want to go to places that are more economically free. Uh, 73% of studies that have looked at economic freedom and income levels find that economic freedom is associated with higher levels of income. In neither of those, by the way, are there negative studies. Nobody finds that that people flee it or that it's associated with lower income. There are a couple of of insignificant results. But a majority of studies find that associated with growth, with entrepreneurship, with conflict, with, with, that has diminished conflict, with better labor conditions, better human rights. The worst you could say is if you look at something like inequality, interestingly enough there, uh, a majority of studies f- 
find no relationship. So 54% of studies find no relationship. Of those studies that do find a relationship, they're actually more inclined to say that economic freedom is associated with diminished inequality, that is greater equality, than find that it associated, it's associated with, with uh, more inequality. So uh, that's like the worst it gets. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if you look at all these, uh, you know, you, you come, you can't help but come away with, you know, sort of discovering that you've, you've, you've sort of understood what makes the what, what makes the difference between prosperous and working societies and uh, societies that are um, immiserated and don't seem to work very well. And of course, one of the reasons why we care so much about, you know economic freedom and its and its impact on economic growth and all these other measures is because economic growth is not just great to lift people out of poverty, even though it does this very well. But it's also, I mean, I assume you've read uh, Benjamin Friedman's book, yes. uh, The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth. It's just, it's like when you have economic growth, you also have all sorts of things are really good. And and in fact, that may be the most important thing about economic freedom is like you get more tolerance, more freedom of religion, m- more peace. L- lots of really good things are actually born out of kind of an economy that is growing. And the reverse is actually really scary, even in rich societies. That's right. That's because, right. you know, diminishing uh, economic freedom leads to intolerance and 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 all sorts of bad things. And arguably, maybe the time of illiberalism that we're going through right now has a lot to do with slow slow down and economic growth that we've experienced the last twenty some years. Yeah. So this is why economic freedom is 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 so it, it's so important is because it just gives us all the stuff that you want on the economic side, but also, uh, on all other fronts, right? That's, right? that's right. So yeah, prosperity seems to make us better. Yeah. And economic freedom seems to make us prosperous. Now, it's not the only thing that can make people prosperous. Well, this is not to say that geography doesn't matter. This is not to say that culture doesn't yeah. matter. But uh, geography and culture are really hard to change, right? You know, uh, as much as they would like it, policymakers cannot change culture overnight, nor can they move mountains overnight. But you really can have a very quick change in institutions and policies that to make your society more economically free. And you can look at places like Georgia, uh, the country, <laughs> or uh, Estonia, and you can see, you know, the dramatic change that can happen in just a matter of years and, and what happens when you liberate people and then the outcomes that, that you can expect from that. So, yeah, it's, it, it's uh, amazing how many aspects of our lives it touches. And so, I mean, I guess to go back to Friedman, right, and to that first at the Montpelerin yep. uh, meeting, which I didn't know that story, by the way. I think it's it's great. It explains, right, how economic freedom really is essential for all these other the political freedom, the uh, uh, you know the and all the other freedoms that we really care about. Yeah, that's right. And and again, I'll go back to, you know, one of my favorite uh, examples here is if you want to understand why is it that economic freedom is related to things like political freedom and personal freedom, uh, I suggest there's no better way than to look at the, uh, the Soviet Union. So they wanted to control what people thought. And so one way to do that is to control, if you want to control the economic means of production, right? The best way to do that in in their view was let's control how people think. And if you want to control how people think, you now need to control the arts. You need to control radio and TV. You need to control the means of creative uh, production. So they literally controlled who has access to ink, who has access to paint, who has access to to canvas. If you wanted to paint in the former Soviet Union, you needed to be a member of the union. And in order, and and only then would that entitle you to canvas and paint. And so that's how you get. And I assume you could only paint stuff that was approved by exactly the exactly. regime. They called it Soviet. They called it uh, socialist realism, uh, and it wasn't real. It was the the imagined state that would come about after all this misery. Uh, we they were we were through with all this misery of of uh, you know the workers uh, rebelling. (laughs) And once we finally had, had uh, put in all of our labor and time, then we would realize this, this beautiful, uh, you know, future. So, you you know, in a very real sense, the way to 
permit people more political freedom and civil freedom is to allow them to use econo- make economic choices on their own to buy their own paint. <laughs> uh, that makes a big difference. And uh, you know, going back to that original question that Walker had and that they were debating, uh, indeed, this has now been studied by quite a few of the, the researchers that I was mentioning that have used the index. And we now know, um, sure enough, if you compare economic freedom with uh, personal freedom, we, there's various indices of personal freedom out there, or you compare it with political freedom, uh, they're positively correlated. Wow, that's awesome. So let's talk about the index. So you told us the areas that you guys are measuring with the index. So there's the size of government, legal system and property rights. Third is sound money. Then you have the fourth is freedom of trade uh, yeah. internationally, and then regulation. Where does immigration fall into this? So immigration will be measured in some of the components of international trade uh, in terms of the restrictions on people crossing borders. We also pick that up in the, the companion index, the human freedom index, where we look uh, a little bit more closely at, at those types of uh personal liberties, uh, like the liberty to, to relocate. Yeah, actually, I always kind of wonder where immigration falls, because this has enormous economic implication, but fundamentally, is it is it an economic freedom? Uh, well, and that's I mean, it's, it's kind of a mix of both, because if you're moving for the sake of actually working, right, Yeah, absolutely. So if you look, one of the things that I did in this, uh, I wrote a, a primer, it came out in September, called economic freedom. What is it? Um, how is it measured? And how does it affect our lives? And one of the things that I include there is a, this just, you know, kind of simple Venn diagram at the beginning that describes personal freedoms and economic freedoms. And it's a Venn diagram that, and the, the whole thing is human freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the intersection of the two, there are some, some things that are really probably both. Uh, yeah. I would say immigration is both. The examples I use is, you know, the, the freedom to use your home as a place of work. That would be an example of a, of a deeply personal freedom, but also an economic freedom. And uh, the right to use your body for work. Uh, that, too, is a, it really kind of fits both categories. So, yeah, you'll, you'll find some of those cases. But, like, it's in the, um, the area for freedom to trade internationally where we find that control of, under control of movement of capital and people, we have some uh, indicators there that, that uh, account for uh, some, some of the, de- the degree of uh, restrictions on, on movement. Yeah, and and this is all the more important because obviously trade is at the center of a lot of discussion with President Trump being so protectionist and have having turned so many people, I mean, against trade really. And I was actually reading that in a, in a, it's it's so it pulls so well with voters being protectionist that actually the Democrats like Bob Casey and uh, and Sherrod Brown. They literally are cutting ads to say that they agree with Trump on trade. It's like, I mean, this is a dark, dark time. Yeah. So let's let's talk about. So you have how many country? 145, 165, 165, yeah, 165. Like, so who are the who are your top countries? Who are the most economically free countries? So we've talked. So it's like Hong Kong, Singapore closer yep. than it was before to being number two, then who do you, who else do you have? Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Switzerland, mm-hmm. uh, New Zealand, uh, the United States comes in at number five. Uh, and then it's uh, Denmark, Ireland, Canada, Luxembourg, Australia, and Japan that, ra- that ra- uh, rounds out the top. And then, you know, at the, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, it's exactly kind of what you would think the, the least economically free place that we can measure is Venezuela. I bet if there were enough data to measure uh, North Korea and, and Cuba, I think they would probably give Venezuela a run for their money. But uh, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Sudan, uh, Syria, Algeria, Myanmar, uh, Argentina, and I- Iran are all at the bottom of the list. So before we go and talk about all these different countries, I want to ask you about a trend that I find actually quite you know, disturbing which is that in the past, I mean, I guess, I mean, several decades, right? Economic freedom around the world has tended to grow, right? There's usually a decline in economic freedom globally during recessions because of large government intervention, especially in Western countries, you know, like you have the 2008, the, the Great Recession and all the 
Western European countries and the, and the U.S. give tons of stimulus and all of that stuff and regulate banks and blah and do this and that, yeah. right? But usually it picks back up. And then in the last, I guess, four years, five years, six years maybe, I can't really quite tell on that. We've seen a decline. And I mean, it's a pretty significant decline that uh, seems to continue yeah. past the COVID pandemic crisis of decline in economic freedom around the world. Yeah. So, okay. So here, here's a few stats on, on this. So it, one way to think about it, you can kind of think about phases. So basically from 1980 through 2007, every single year economic freedom in the world, if you average across all countries, it increased. Okay. And you can divide that even up into, into different portions. So in the 1980s were a pretty darn good time in terms of increasing economic freedom. So if you think about, you know, Western countries, the United States, thanks to uh, President Carter, prior President Carter, more than, more than Reagan, uh, you know, there's because Reagan. of the deregulation. That's right. And we were uh, generally Western countries all over cut taxes, got spending under control. Scandinavian countries had radically increased their economic freedom during this time period. And well, that's that's true. That's when they actually, Sweden did major, in the 70s, major um, reforms. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, got their fiscal house in order. Yeah. Um, and then you had, you know, China uh, is opening that's up true. markets during the 1980s. And then you had uh, the fall of communism. So in the 1990s, you had this huge, uh, you know, probably the most rapid increase in economic freedom around the world uh, happened from like 91 through 2000. After about 2000, we continue to see increases in global economic freedom, but it's at a, at a markedly lower lower pace. There aren't these exciting examples like Estonia and Georgia and uh, Southeast Asia, where, pe- where countries are just leaping ahead. Instead, it's just much, much slower pace of growth. Then you get the financial uh, crisis, 2007, as you're right, economic freedom declines, but it's back growing what yeah, you know, yeah. next year. What's different about COVID? So our data is always two years lag. So, so it's like, so 2007, it declines. It, it, goes and that's it's at 6.55 at, at its peak in 2007 declines to in 2008 to 6.44 so it's actually quite a small decline and by 2010 it's above the 20 2007 number yeah i think it's uh yeah 2010 i thought it was 2012 yeah you're about yeah you're right basically it's yeah back. it was a, it was six six Point fifty four in twenty ten, and it was six point fifty five in two thousand and seven. Yeah. So it's it cut up, yeah. and it, so it took it took uh, I guess really two years, three years. Yeah. Yeah. But now, now enter COVID, and what we have never seen in the history of the index is three consecutive years of, of collapsing economic freedom. Um, because that's, because that's the last one, the one that, that I mentioned, is was one year of decline, and then right. a climb back up, yep. and this is like three years, and it started between between twenty nineteen and twenty twenty. That's right. Yeah. So the and you can kind of see that you know you can see the areas in which it's it's declined you know most significantly. I've got I've got an op-ed that's coming out soon on this, but so the the interestingly enough the the, the area that. In 2019 through 2020, the area that collapsed the most was freedom to trade internationally. And it goes right back to your question, Mm -hmm. where is immigration? So you you have basically every country in the world suddenly say you can't you can't visit here (laughs) uh, to do business. Uh, Boom. That's limiting people's ability to make their own economic decisions. And you had at the same time, of course, you had some Trump uh, (laughs) barriers to trade and uh, many trade wars uh, propping up everywhere. And then, and then size of government collapses quite a bit as well in 2019, 2020, as governments are introducing new, new spending and new programs. And I, I wonder also, I actually wonder what 2023 is going to look like because of inflation. Exactly. And, and, you know, I mean, inflation started in 2021 and like, you know, in the, in, in the, let's say it was really visible. It started to be really visible in spite of the, though it's transitory I would say in the spring of 2021, and then inf- I mean the, the the fight against inflation. I mean it really ramped up in 2022. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's what you see here. But- so that's exactly right. So so w- one great bit of news is the freedom to trade internationally is actually quite 
quite up this year from tw- or t- 2022. Uh, it, it, it rose quite a bit, but uh, sound money plummeted <laughs> in 2022. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and essentially, you know, what's happened is as go- go- governments introduced the new spending and now they, and then they printed, turned to the printing press to finance it. And now you've got uh, a big deterioration in sound money. Now sound money can bounce around quite a bit uh, of all the, the sort of areas of economic freedom. That's one where you can see pretty significant changes from year to year. So, you know, if governments, uh, you know, as it seems like they might be on the cusp of doing, you know, manage to get inflation under control, I actually predict that won't last too long. Another, I would say, maybe bright spot here is that all throughout this, the legal systems and property rights, there's very little movement in, in terms of our, our measure of those. And, and that does seem to be a component of economic freedom that matters uh, quite a bit for all sorts of other outcomes, and including even int- it matters intrinsically. So, so actually, that, that's, uh, a good, that's a good point. Do you find that there are some measure, uh, some in, of all the components, which one do you think is the one that actually matters the most? Or is it kind of actually it doesn't matter because they reinforce each other? Like you can have a decline in one and it affects the other. I mean, how, how, what do you know on this, on this front? Yeah, it's a great question. So legal system and property right does seem to matter the most. Okay. However, yeah. Um, institutions. Yeah. How, how, yeah. So this is where like, you know, Darren, uh, Daron Asamoglu kind of likes this aspect of the economic freedom index. Um, yeah. However, uh, there is some interesting research, uh, Russ Sobel, and um, I can't remember who his co-author was, but he had a study a few years ago where they just had a, a very simple metric where they, they included variance between the five components. And essentially, and that it improved uh, their growth estimates quite a bit. And essentially, the, the lesson here is that some aspects of, of economic freedom probably do matter more than others, but they all need to work together. You cannot have yeah. a, a really good uh, legal system and property rights and and hope that that makes up for really bad policies in terms of regulation, size of government, freedom to trade international yeah. sound money. It, it's, it, it does really matter to have all of them. Now, there's another nuance here too. Size of government uh, is sometimes it's considered, you know, the weakest in terms of its its predict, prediction on uh, economic prosperity. And I think that's probably, you know, generally true. You know, if, if legal system and property rights matters the most, followed maybe closely by sound money and regulation um, and freedom to trade internationally, size of government probably matters the least. But it, it, it also has a different effect in different types of countries. So uh, large size of size of government, interestingly enough, is most damaging to growth in a country like the United States that is already high income. It's it's least damaging to growth in a country like Sudan. And why would might this be? Well, just think about it. The size of government is some of what government is doing is it's protecting property rights, right? It's policing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's some of those protective forms of government. So if you have very little development and um, you have very little economic freedom, uh, hiring a few more police officers and asking them to protect property rights is not necessarily going to be the worst thing, even though it might swell the budget of your police. Yeah, board. yeah, yeah. Not necessarily a bad thing. But if you're in a country like the United States or Canada or, or much of Western Europe, that's where uh, the size of government does actually start to take a bite out of uh, economic growth. And it really does uh, matter if you can if you can reduce your size that size of government component, then you can you can see faster growth. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, recently it's it's interesting that you said this because recently I was actually trying to look at the best studies on the size of government impact on economic growth, mm-hmm. and there's just not a lot of really good things. But what basically I came up with is kind of like to the best I could tell is exactly the story you, you, you tell, which is kind of, it's a lafer curve type thing where there's like, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a, if you start from, from zero, like the, all the first stuff that the government does at the beginning, very likely is going to be some, some of the things that actually encourage economic growth yep. and then past a certain point, they start doing stupid things like actually stopping you from from working from home, right? Of starting a business at home, like all sorts of really stupid things that are just like that that are like the stuff they should not be doing in the first place. Yeah. And so, but it's, it's it's that's the best type kind of things thing I, I could find. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, maybe if you think about it uh, broadly is the first few, uh, you know, growth enhancing things are, let's put it in the, in the terms of uh, the latest Nobel laureates, you know, they're, uh, they, they create more of an open access order that's non-discriminatory, that's basically helps everybody, right? You know, yeah. if you're going to pr- uh, protect uh, persons and their property, that doesn't, it, it, it does me no harm to have your person and your property also protected. Where they where it starts to get you know dicey is the more extractive institutions end of it, where governments start to develop policies programs that take from some aspects of society and give to others. So you know, crony capitalism or discrimination or whatever you want to call it, um, that's where you start to get into you know uh, basically everything that the Department of Agriculture does. <laughs> yeah. That kind of stuff is really not good for growth. A lot of what the Department of Commerce does. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. right. That's right. You know, if you remove census and the the, the patent, well, it, actually, I guess on the patent, it depends on which side of the libertarian debate to fall. But <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, yeah. at the very least, it's in the Constitution. You know, but everything else is like the yeah. Department of Cronyism. Really, exactly. we should we should call it. What's the U.S.? Can you tell us about the U.S.? Uh, what do you What do you guys find? So, I, because I remember like the U.S. was falling. How about this one? It's it's relatively similar to essentially the global average. So if you think about the, the story I began with is, you know, relatively big increases in terms of economic freedom in the first, you know, the 1980s and continuing into the 1990s, but really a, a, quite a bit of leveling off. Uh, that happens right around uh, the turn of the century, around 2000. And from that point on, it's uh, we, we just don't see much, you know, increases in economic freedom. You see, you did see quite a bit of decline actually, starting around in the Bush end of the Bush years, and then into the Obama years, uh, and we've sort of just kind of muddled through since then. So, for a country like the United States or like Canada, what I would say is, you know, you were once on this path where sort of everybody agreed that we need to increase economic freedom. It's interesting that our growth rates have. Uh, you know, essentially halved once the United States stopped increasing economic freedom. And I would say, you know, that's maybe you need to look to some other countries that have done some pretty radical changes, Estonia, Georgia, Latvia, um, Lithuania. Uh, Those are, there's some pretty exciting examples out there and what they've achieved. Mm -hmm. Uh, It could be that again. Let me ask you, so how, what do you see and were you able to measure the impact of uh, lockdowns uh, during COVID on economic freedom around the world? Because so I guess, I don't know where it falls, lockdowns, but it's a regulation, obviously, and it affects commerce, it affects the economy. In fact, the point of the lockdowns was to just, you know, stop the economy. So yep. w- what were you, how, I mean, how much of a role does it play globally in the, in the, 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 the third year decline in economic freedom globally and in the U S yeah. Great question. So one thing that we, you know, we have a tension when you develop an index like this, where you want to make sure that you use consistent kind of apples to apples comparisons across geography and across time. That is problematic when government is really innovative in its ways of, of <laughs> cracking down on economic freedom. <laughs> so if the government, if, if one government, one somewhere in the in the world finds a new and innovative way to crack down on economic freedom that nobody else has done before you, you know we have a debate do we change the index to incorporate this on the one hand you want to make sure that we are accounting for those idiosyncratic infringements um, but on the other hand you don't want to change the index constantly every yeah. year and otherwise and, you can't compare it exact over time and one thing i should say by the way is that users should always use the latest index because we do make changes. And when we make the changes, we then retroactively apply them to all past years. So we use the latest data and also governments revise their data to the, the, the underlying data upon which we sometimes uh, rely that gets revised. Uh, okay. So all of this is to say uh, we did not have an indicator in the economic freedom of the world that says government will <laughs> is closing all restaurants. Yeah. It didn't occur to us. It didn't but I don't, I wonder, I wonder whether you can pick it up indirectly. So, so there, there have been, there's a, there's a paper by Vincent uh, Miozzi and uh, Ben Powell uh, that does exactly this. So uh, it's called measuring economic freedom during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
they uh, essentially take indicators of uh, these kinds of idiosyncratic changes that happen and build them into the index and, and uh, start with the EFW, the Economic Freedom of the World Index, and add on to it, which, you know, we love to do. You know, ben and is, is, a, is a good friend. And uh, I love to see people take the index and run with it and, you know, extend it in different ways. Yeah, I, this is kind of one of the things that I guess, yeah, I mean, is really one of the most interesting thing is how uh, economists and scholars have actually used the index to pursue other questions yes. uh, in, entirely. And, and, and in fact, Bob Lawson and a few of his co-authors have actually done a really good job at actually going through all of these studies that have used the index to actually say, this is, as, I mean, this is what you were this is the, the results when you were saying, you know, uh, this is how it co- correlates to all of these different uh, things. That's that's you were reading from. Uh, I assume Bob's Bob's work on this, where he he really went and looked at all of these studies and say, here is what it says, and and I can see that this was kind of unexpected. It was kind of one of the innovation that was possible because the index existed. Well, and another interesting innovation that's happened is, you know, in the first uh, decade or so of the index, the main people who used it were free market advocates. But in the last five or six years, we're actually seeing a lot more skeptics of free markets employ the index. And that's really welcome news. We, We want that because, you know, while the index is one of the things we try to stress is the index is designed to measure economic freedom. It's not necessarily designed to measure what Bob Lawson says is ideal policy yeah. or what Matt Mitchell says is ideal policy. We may have our opinion, but what we need to do, you know, once you start saying like, like uh, one to go back to the COVID question, people will often say, well, why would you say that, uh, you know, yes, economic freedom fell during COVID, but maybe that was a good thing. And I say, yeah, maybe it was. Absolutely. You need to go out and measure whether it's a good thing. What we're doing with the index is we're trying to get a comprehensive assessment on one side of the ledger, which is what is the effect of these policies on economic. Yeah, I can, I can imagine some, some people will go and say, countries that constrain economic freedom the most had the best health outcome. Yeah. If they found that, that's great. You know, good on them for, for looking at that. We just want to make sure that we're accounting for the costs. The yes. other way you could say that is, uh, okay, your your measures to save lives, they did actually constrain economic freedom. And we do know that that undermines other aspects of well-being. But let's just make sure that we're, we're consistent about it. So one of the things that, that's uh, happened is a lot of progressives have started to use the index and they're you know using it to measure their own uh, interests. Inequality uh, studies have, have increased quite a bit in, in recent years employing the index. And that's great. Yeah. And uh I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because you know then you have to you have to kind of actually it, it makes us think about what are the questions the most pressing questions we need to answer. I don't know if you've seen looked at the work of Vincent Geloso, yeah, who's actually it's pretty awesome actually where he ties it all together. You know, the mainline thinking, economic freedom, inequality, and where he actually shows basically that. When you have an increase in inequality, effectively what you're showing is a poor quality of the institution as opposed to uh, like, so so basically uh, inequality is the outcome of the lack of economic freedom as opposed, and and of the kind of poor quality of the institution as opposed to to the cause. And which I, I think that all of these, none of that work, which is very rich, in our tradition, uh, our mainline tradition is actually not possible without the uh, the index. Exactly. So, exactly. and that's one of the things I emphasize is just like, okay, you know, uh, you should go out and read Smith, but you should also read Marx, and you should read Keynes, and you should read the critics. And there's compelling arguments. But the way that, you know, scientists should resolve these arguments is not to just continue to use our blackboard, but go out into the real world and look at what actually happens. And as it turns out, we have a way of measuring economic freedom and we can test hypotheses. We can look at Keynes's hypothesis that, you know, uh, more economically free places are going to have a more volatile macro economy. Turns out that that is not really well supported in the data. We can look at the at uh, Pagu's 
you know, hypothesis that you would need taxes is the, are the best way to control for negative externalities. Well, that's not well supported. We actually find um, there's overwhelming evidence that more economically free places are cleaner environments. So, you know, as scientists, this is just a, a great tool to answer, ask some of those questions. You mentioned, Vincent, I have to uh, put in a plug for one of my favorite uh, recent economic freedom papers. Uh, he had this idea with some co-authors a couple of years ago, I guess, where they were thinking, you know, the least economically free places tend to be dictatorships oh, they, yeah, yeah. because they don't, they lack up what we were talking about earlier, political freedom and economic freedom go together and dictators tend to lie. Yeah. They lie about their GDP. And so uh, I wonder if we're actually underestimating the effect of economic freedom because we've got all these dictators in the, in the bottom quartile of economic freedom and they're probably uh, goosing or lying about their GDP numbers. And so they thought, well, what's a what's an objective way that we can assess what's going on in terms of economic development? And we don't need to get inside the country. We don't need to get get a hold of their data. Well, we can look at the night sky and the, the night's uh, satellite images of uh, light at night are a very strong predictor of economic development. And so they can use that to do a, an estimate of the uh, real GDP that's going on in the countries and then re-estimate the effect of economic freedom. And lo and behold, they find that we've been underestimating the benefit, beneficial effects of economic freedom. Yeah, I saw that paper. I thought I was I thought it was so great. Yeah, very clever. And, uh, and, and for anyone who has never actually looked, compare South Korea with North Korea at night, just Google this, mm -hmm. and it's like striking. Yeah. It's, it's, it's striking. There's one that's lit up like a Christmas tree and the other one is totally dark. One of the things that I do, because that image has been you know, so well circulated, a lot of people have encountered that. One of the things I do is I show it during the day and you can actually see the difference. If you have a nice high resolution image, you can see the difference during the day because North Korea is totally uh, deforested and there's not much yeah. agriculture. And so you can see the line uh, where it's green in the South and it's brown in the North. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So I want to ask you, so this is, am I right that this is your first year producing the, ind the index or is this your second year? Kind of, a little bit of both. I basically was uh, came on board uh, two years ago, but I've been shadowing uh, my predecessor, Fred McMahon, um, and this is my first year uh, as the uh, project lead. So, so the reason why I'm asking this is because my whole life working with you, you were the economic uh, economic freedom guy, uh, at least in my head, is like if I if I if I want to actually kind of think or write something about economic freedom, I Google economic freedom, Matt Mitchell. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, I do, this is what I do, right? And it's so interesting to me that you came, you you have spent so much of your career actually studying the impact and, and the importance of economic freedom, and and now you're producing the index. Have you learned anything that you that you didn't know producing the index that you hadn't come across while studying the issue of economic freedom? That's a great question. Well, I mean, yeah. So I, I, as before, I was always a consumer of it, you know, really. And even now I'm uh, still learning so much from Bob uh, and Ryan in terms of, you know, what goes into the, the construction of the index. Uh, I guess what I, what I'm learning is just that if you want what I didn't quite appreciate is all the all, everything that goes on behind the scenes in terms of decisions that have to be made about, okay, uh, you know, the doing business report is discontinued. The World Bank is not yeah. doing that. Apparently, I, they're redoing it, and it's not that great. Yeah, Apparently, right. they've made a lot of uh, changes. There's some com They have a new index called the Be Ready Index, and some components of it are going to be useful, but uh, a lot of it is not going to be useful. Yeah. So it's a uh, – essentially, you know – uh, I guess when Bob signed on to this 28 years ago, he was jumping on a treadmill that he was having to commit to be on every single year is because there's changes in the data and you've got to, you've got to make yeah. trade-offs and decide, okay, what do we do when this index is discontinued and we try to supplement it? And so I, I'm, I'm learning a lot about that. You know, it's not, it's not a set it and forget it kind of a, a phenomenon. These guys are constantly working on it to, to improve it every year. So are you, are you going to be leading that effort next year? Well, I mean, I foresee Bob, Bob is going to be the, the lead author of the index for uh, a, a, as long as uh, we can, we can uh, have him around. But I'm always happy to help. And um, always, I think I'm always going to be a part of the project in terms of commissioning the reports. And then I, where I kind of see 
my comparative advantage is, you know, as you said, I've always been reading this index and talking about it and, and writing about it. I'm happy to let Bob do the index and I go out and promote it and, and talk to the world about it because that's, I'm just really passionate about that. So let me ask this final question, which is based on everything you know about economic freedom, what would you say to those who are calling for degrowth? Uh, yeah, I mean, what I would say is almost everything that you cherish as a human, especially if you are a progressive human who values, you know, the well-being of vulnerable populations, the uh, tolerance, equality among the, the sexes, uh, almost everything that you cherish as a human is served well by economic freedom. There's very little downside to economic freedom, um, the environment, uh, tolerance, uh, peace, all of these things correlate so, so strongly with economic freedom. Uh, you know, it's in your best interest to not only hope for growth, but hope for freedom. Well, Matt, this was delightful. It's so good to see you. I mean, to hear you. So thanks so, so much. Thanks, Vera. I, I always love chatting with you and I always learn so much from our conversations. Thank you. <laughs>